Hallelujah. Mark the fourth chapter. And uh, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's faith that pleases God. Hallelujah. Of course, you know, we, in, this, in this series on the parable of the sower, we find out that the seed, which was God's word, Mark 4, verse 14, and uh, the seed was sown in four different environments of soil. It was, it was hard ground, it was, there was a stony ground, and there was uh, weed-infested ground, and then there was good ground. Amen. And uh, we know that uh, only one of those produced a harvest at all. all uh, the first three never produced anything, a crop failure. But the last one did produce. What that tells is that it's more of a challenge than one thinks when it comes to, uh, when it comes to harvesting Excuse me, the character or the attributes of God. That's what this is all about. This is all about you and I carrying the presence of God in our lives on a daily basis. Amen? Why? So that people might see Christ in us. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. So, uh, so for God, uh, uh, nothing less and nothing more uh, th- th- than this in your life. He wants you to harvest his attributes. He wants you to become uh, God-like in an ungodly world. And, uh, to do, and he also wants you to preserve these four divine virtues in your life. There are four divine virtues. We know that in Matthew 18, out of the Amplified Bible, it's trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving. Those are the attributes that God wants not only to develop, uh, uh, he, wants them, he wants for you to develop them in your life so that they'll be developed in your children's lives. Amen. And so those are the most important things. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said this. He said, you are God's garden. He goes on and says this. You're God's garden, uh, his vineyard, and, and you're his field under, under cultiva- cultiva- cultivation. Amen. And how well we manage these spiritual gardens will ultimately determine what kind of harvest we do reap. How, how many want to harvest good things of God in your life? Amen. Well, to do that, then uh, seed time... Uh, will be required of you uh, um, to constantly be sowing those things in your life. Now, Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 20. The Amplified says, those sown on the good, I like the Amplified, the well-adapted soil, the well-adapted soil, that word uh, uh, good in the Greek means beautiful. So those sown on the beautiful, virtuous, honest, and valuable soil, that's what it says there, okay? So a good person a good-hearted person in the midst of adversity, hardship, difficulty, ridicule, offense, listen, is willing to adapt to what would Jesus do instead of uh, yielding to his own carnality, okay? So remember we used to wear the bracelets, what would WWJD? Well, it is important to know what would Jesus do, but it's more importantly what, what you do, amen. We know what he'll do. But it's what we do that is going to determine what kind of harvest that we reap, okay? The, lab, the living Bible says, but the good soil represents the hearts of those who truly accept uh, the message. Or I put in here, truly accepts the responsibility of living the message and produce a plentiful harvest for God, 30, 60, even 100 times as much as was planted in their hearts. Hallelujah. Amen. So what constitutes a good heart? We're going to look at this this morning. What constitutes, I mean, uh, Bible speaking or scripturally speaking, what constitutes a good heart? I mean, if it's the only piece of real estate that produced a harvest, then we really need to understand what constitutes uh, a good heart. What, what, What must we do to prepare a good heart? Now, David because I'll read here in Psalms 37, because he, he uh, penned or wrote Psalms 37, obviously he had experience uh, with a good heart at some times in his life. Here's what it says. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. That word, the steps of a good man, the word good there in the Hebrew means a valiant and strong warrior. A valiant and strong warrior. And when I read that, I was reminded, again, it reminded me of Gideon. Can you imagine, as you, if you'll study Judges 4, I believe it is, you'll realize that God told him to choose out 300 men out of, I think they started with 32,000, 300 men, listen, and go out and, listen to me, face an enemy army of 135,000. So he... Can you imagine the valiant, the courage that he had to have to do that? Because uh, in the natural, it's complete suicide. 
In the natural, it's complete foolishness. But God will always, always choose the foolish things to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. And so uh, he faced 135,000 enemy troops with 300 guys listening. What did they have in their possession? A horn and a clay pot. We're going to die. <laughs> a horn in a clay pot. I mean, it don't even make sense. And yet, as we read, you find out that the enemy uh, was wiped out, amen, of their lives because they obeyed God. Can I have an amen? So the steps of a good man, a valiant and strong warrior, and that means spiritually, a, a, a valiant regarding your faith in God and strong regarding, praise God, your devotion to him. Verse 23, uh, the Living Bible. The steps of a good man are directed by the Lord. He delights in each step they take. If they fall, it isn't fatal, for the Lord holds them with his hand. Can you say thank you, Lord? Thank you. Amen. This morning, I, I, w- I went to bed last night, of course, uh, sleeping, and I woke up a couple times during the night, but I woke up around... Uh, uh, I think it was like 10 after 3, and I said, Lord, I'd sure like to sleep a little bit longer, uh, but could you wake me up at 4.20? Because I said, at 4.30, my alarm goes off, and I don't want my precious wife to be awakened. At 4.20, my eyes popped open, and the first thing out of my mouth was, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't know if he tickled me. I have no idea what he did, but <laughs> praise God, pop my eyes open at 4.20. Is God good or what? Amen. I mean, the very, thank you. <laughs> ah, man, you need to control this young man up here. He just gets carried away. Don't ever lose your fire for God. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't ever lose your fire for God. Um, the reason sometimes people like that act like that is because they value what they have. They value what they have. Amen. Thank you, God. Let's go on. He says, if they fall, it isn't fatal. I have, I have been young and now I am old, David said. And in all my years, I have never seen the Lord forsake a man who loves him, nor have I seen the children of the godly going hungry. Woo! Hallelujah. Verse 28, for the Lord loves justice and fairness. He will never abandon his people. They will be kept safe forever. But all who love wickedness shall perish. The godly shall be firmly planted in the land and live there forever. Now watch this. The godly man or woman is a good counselor because he is just and fair and knows right from wrong. Why is this important? Because today the wrong is right and the right is wrong. The bitter is sweet, the sweet is bitter. The light is dark and the dark is light. And so you better know the truth. Amen. You better know so you can help point people in the right direction. Amen. Anytime they have a cat litter box in a school bathroom, uh, you know, uh, for somebody who thinks they're a cat, uh, they can go. I mean, it's just insane. But this is the craziness of ungodliness if we allow it to reign. Can I have an amen? It's just twisted thinking. So the Lord said he will make a godly man a good counselor. Hallelujah. So the four different environments into which a seed was sown, uh, sown I told you uh, earlier, the four of them, heart, stony, thorny, and good. Now, uh, because of that, a good heart couldn't be one. So what a, uh, let me tell you what a good heart isn't. A good heart couldn't be one that is hard, obstinate, rebellious, and unyielding. A good heart couldn't be one that is spiritually shallow, carnal, and easily offended. Nor could it be one who, who is suffocated by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things. Now, these are things that are so important. If you haven't been coming, a lot of people don't come on Wednesday nights. So uh, you know, just life is busy. And, uh, but you need to really discern the value of these services. Uh, just twice a week. Just twice a week. There are churches now that only have church on Sunday mornings. And, and uh, some even cancel for the summer. But how in the world can you survive without getting the spiritual sustenance you need for all the attacks that come in your life? And so these meetings are important. But if you haven't been to all of the series of this, uh, go listen to them. Go listen to them again. Even if you've been here, they'll help you. How many want a good heart all the days of your life? Amen. There's things that you must do uh, if you're going to keep a good heart that uh, brings glory to God. A good heart... uh, uh, What does a good heart look like? A good heart is humble, 
tender, pliable, receptive, subservient, and yielding to God and his will. A good heart is responsive to self-judgment and repentance, followed by surrender and self-sacrifice. A good heart is one that loves unconditionally, forgives and gives without any strings attached. And a good heart uh, consistently bears the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Galatians 5, we've read them many times, but when the whole, I love this, when the Holy Spirit controls our life. The Holy Spirit controls our lives. I told you this before, because today, uh, you know, everybody pulls out the slave card. We're slaves. Well, you're either going to be a slave to God or a slave to sin. Which one would you like to be enslaved to? The more you're enslaved to Christ, the greater freedoms you have. The more you're enslaved to sin, the greater bondages you have. Your choice, what do you want? Amen. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. What is it? We've read it before. Love. Let's all say it out loud. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. And this, listen, this, def- this divine fruit isn't any different than any other fruit. It, it starts in seed form. So if you want to reap these things in your life, you have to sow them. Now listen to me. You have to sow them often by faith. Do you understand that? You have to sow them by faith. Because today, I mean, we drive up to a Burger King if they don't have our meal in 30 seconds. <laughs> if your computer doesn't have that answer in, in uh, uh, one Tenth of a second, we start to panic. <laughs> but the godlike life is not that way. You sell out to God no matter what. And you stay sold out to God no matter what. So to reap a harvest of godly character, you have to show these attributes. Today I want to give you an example of what a good-hearted person looks like. Amen. We've talked about the others. We're going to spend time here. In uh, 2 Samuel, the fourth chapter, uh, this is a beautiful story. Let me just, uh, let me just uh, prep it with this. At this time in history, king, uh, Saul was the king of Israel. In fact, the Bible says that God chose Saul to be king because he also, at that time in his life, had a tender heart. And so he became king of Israel. But over time, say over time, amen, he allowed he allowed his heart to become, heart to become infected and, uh, and, and then began to rebel against God's will. And in doing so, he kept getting harder and harder and harder within until God could not get his attention anymore. And so what does God do? God said, by the prophet, he told him, your kingship is no longer uh, valid. And so he said, I'm going to choose a new king. Well, once, once uh, King Saul found out that uh, David was going to be the next king of Israel, listen to this, he spent the next 13, year, years, 13 years demonically obsessed with finding David to kill him. Now listen to me. It wasn't just Saul. Saul had an army after David. Think about that. 13, not 13 days, 13 weeks, 13 months, uh, 13 years he was on the run. And God took care of him. Why? Because God prophesied that David was going to become king and nothing could stop that from coming to pass pass as long as David remained uh, loyal to God, which he did. Amen. So King Saul was after them. And so finally, finally, we find out that uh, in the first part of of, uh, 2 Samuel that Saul went to battle and lost his life and uh, along with that, his son Jonathan. And what's so interesting about David, you talk about a man that, uh, that had a good heart. You'll find out in the first chapter of 2 Samuel that when David heard that Saul died, the Bible says that he wept. He didn't applaud. He didn't rejoice. He didn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, dance. He wept. Why? Because David loved Saul. Hallelujah. He, he loved and respected and honored him. In fact, the Bible says that he wouldn't even touch God's anointed. Amen. And today we have such carelessness in the body of Christ, as, you know, of, of people putting down uh, the man of God in the pulpit. And you better be careful when you do that. Because he's not any different than you. Got the same frailty, the same challenges of life, 
but there's a calling on his life. There's an anointing on his life that you better be very careful on how you tread towards that um, in a negative way. Uh, and so that was so interesting. There was a cave. Uh, there was a cave that King Saul went into. The Bible says, I laugh, relieve himself. And so while he's in there relieving himself, he was standing a foot away from David who's in the dark. And David took a knife and he just plucked off a part of his robe and the convicting power of God pierced his heart because he touched God's anointed. I mean, in the natural, I, I'm sure his, all of his military men, uh, he had a bunch of men with him at that time. And I'm sure that they were saying, God, this is, your, this is your chance. This is your chance. Kill this evil man, this demon-possessed man. But he wouldn't. He refused. He would not touch God's anointed. Pretty powerful. I said pretty powerful. David had a good heart. Praise God. Amen. All right. So... After, king, after David has been sworn in as king of Israel, uh, uh, in those days, any, any preceding king and his relatives were all killed so that there would never be any kind of insurrection. But see, a good-hearted person wouldn't do that. And that was with David. So let's read and pick up this story. 2 Samuel 4, 4, it's on the screen. Now Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, well, the Bible says that she picked Mephibosheth up and she fled. Why? Because she knew that kings, new kings would kill everybody in the family of the preceding king. So she picks up this little guy and runs for her life. But in doing so, the Bible says that she dropped Mephibosheth and he became a cripple. Five years old, normal, everything going for him. And the nurse drops him. And you know what? I just thought about when I was reading that this morning. She probably carried that guilt the rest of her life for what she had, the mistake that she had made. So the Bible says that uh, she, uh, she dropped him and he became a cripple. Now, 16 years later, chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, Mephibosheth is now 21 years old. Amen. And let's read what happened. So he summoned, David summoned a man named Ziba. Oh, excuse me, verse one, forgive me. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Think about this. I just, you talk about a man of God. Is there anybody in Saul's family that's still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? See, he was in covenant. He, he entered a blood covenant with Jonathan. And therefore, in that blood covenant, uh, David had a, didn't have to keep it because the man was dead. Jonathan was gone. So at that point, the covenant is, uh, you know, no longer uh, enforced. But he enforced it anyway because he loved Jonathan as a brother. He wanted to bless anybody that was still alive in Saul's family. So he summoned a man by the name of uh, Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba, the king asked? And he said, sir, I am. And, and Ziba, replied, Ziba replied, the king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. <clears throat> well, Ziba replied, well, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. See, David didn't even know it. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. He's in Lodabar, Ziba told him. Watch this. At the home of Makur, the son of Amiel. I looked up the word Makur. He's in Makur's house. You know what the word Makur means? It means the place of surrender. Oh. oh, God can't help you until you're at that place of total surrender. Listen to this. Verse five. So David sent for him and brought him from the place of surrender, McCurr's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. 
When he came to David, he, David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect, and David said, well, greetings, Mephibosheth. The word Mephibosheth in the uh, Hebrew means a dispeller of shame. He was called literally to, to destroy or get rid of the shame that might have been on Israel. He was called to be a leader of Israel, called to be a king. He was, he was of royal bloodline, this young man. And the, the word dispeller of shame, the word dispel means to remove fears, doubts, and false ideas. Yet for Meshebeth, for the first 21 years of his life, was not dispelling shame, but he was gathering shame along with fear, doubt, and a twisted mindset. And again, what a tragedy, being born the, the grandson of a king, royal bloodline uh, flowing through his veins, destined to be someone who dispels shame, and, um, and uh, uh, yet he became a picture of shame. Not only had become a cripple uh, by no fault of his own, he spent 16 years in a place called Lodabar. <laughs> Amazing. The word Lodabar means a pastorless, barren, and fruitless land. This was the reflection of his life of someone who should be in the king's palace. I've said this to the years, but it repeats. It's worth repeating. Life is not fair, but God is faithful. And if you'll stay with him, he'll take you to places that you've never been, see things you've never seen, do things you've never done. Say God is a good God. Lodabar, pastorless, barren, fruitless land. Zero evidence of what he could have been and what he should have been. But being dropped, that just added misery to his cursed life. Let's go on. So when he came to David, the Bible says he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, you cripple, you cursed lineage of Saul. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, greetings, Mephibosheth, dispeller of shame. And Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid. And David said, I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I mean, can you imagine in 24 hours? I mean, he came from poverty. He came from a barren land to sitting at the king's table. That's you when you receive Christ in your heart. Why don't you give him praise? That's you when you receive Christ in your heart, sitting at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed, watch this. He bowed respectfully and explained, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? See, he had the same image of himself that sometimes we do. He just, uh, he said, I don't deserve this. Uh, no, nah, I'm nothing but a low life. What in the world's going on here? Then the king summoned Saul's servant, Ziba, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. And listen, Saul was the king. He had thousands of acres. He had tons of money. He had horses and, uh, you know, camels and everything that you can imagine. And it all, everything of that was restored. So it reminds me of us. We struggle through this life. All sorts, all sorts of setbacks pain, uh, sorrow, all sorts of, uh, we experience loss, heartache, only to realize that everything, everything that you could ever want in your life is going to be restored to you, hallelujah, when we reach the other side. Why don't you give God a good shout of praise? It's all going to be ours. It's all going to be ours. We just, uh, we're up visiting some friends, and, and uh, they showed us a home uh, of a friend of theirs that they just built, it's like 30,000 square feet. It was a mansion. It was one of the biggest homes I've ever seen, sitting right on the lake. I mean, gorgeous. And I just, and I just quietly said in my mind, I'll probably end up living there one day. <laughs> I mean, if we're faithful to God, you know, I don't know what you have in your mind, but we're going to reign. And there's going to be nothing disappointing when it comes to God's blessing on our lives. We're at least going to reign for a thousand years in the earth in our glorified bodies. We're going to have to live somewhere. 
I'm sure you glad, got excited about that. <laughs> Amen. I'm just saying, and we're going to enjoy it all. Would you all agree that a, what if you live to be 100 years old, that is nothing compared to eternity? Amen. Stan just turned 101. He's doing really good. Praise God. <laughs> well, him and I know. Some of you young people don't know how quick this life goes by. It's just such a, such, it's such a quick life that you, you, you get to the end of your life and you realize, Mike, now I know how life works and then it's over. This one. But the next one's going to be far more glorious. Yeah. Amen. It's just hard for our, our natural minds to conceive such a glorious promise. But it's true and God is not disappointing uh, when it comes to his promises. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's go on. So... The king summoned Saul's servants, Ziba, and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba, watch this. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba replied, are you kidding me? I'm not going to do that for him. No, 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 no. He said, yes, my Lord, the king, I am your servant. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and I will do all that you've commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, hey, things changed. Amen. At 21, he thought that there would never be a future for him. He thought... Never could anything change for me, and it changed that quick. And I want to encourage every one of you, you keep your faith in God, because right. things can change in a moment's time. You just have to remain uh, with a spirit of love and a spirit of expectation in him. Hallelujah. And then all, all of this happened because of one godly, loving, kind, compassionate, caring, and good-hearted man named David. Praise the Lord. I'm going to wind this up by giving you something that I gave years ago called the Cain Syndrome. What does that mean? Everything about the parable of the sower was reversed in Cain's life. Okay? I'll share it. This is so good. Cain began his life with a good, humble, teachable, pliable, tender, submissive, and yielded heart. Full of love, mercy, compassion, and subservience. These were the dominant forces within his heart. However, over time, listen to this, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things entered in and began to choke the godly attributes out of his life. From there, pride and self-righteousness became the dominant force in Cain's field, where offense reigned to, to where he refused to be corrected. Then from there, I mean, even though God himself came to Cain, God himself came to Cain to talk with him. You talk about a hard heart. Cain's heart was already desensitized, unpliable, hard, calloused, and obstinate to God's will. All because he wouldn't steward his heart. All because he thought the problems of life had to do with someone else. Stop and think about it. That's exactly sometimes how we think. That the problems of my life is because of someone else. You are the steward of your heart. You're the, one who's gonna, what, you're the one who's gonna decide what you're gonna allow to come in and begin to grow inside your heart. You are. Second Corinthians 4, this is my, my final long scripture. This is the Passion Bible, listen to this. Now, it's because of God's mercy that we have been entrusted with the privilege of, of this new covenant ministry. And we will not quit or faint with weariness. Say, I will not quit. I will not faint. Amen. Talk about spiritually. Verse 3. Even if our gospel message is veiled, it is only veiled to those who are perishing. Now, I want you to think about a veil. You know, a woman years ago... And when a woman got married, she wore a veil. Uh, and uh, and, and um, 
uh, the husband never saw her face until he removed the veil. So, so the glory of that w- woman's beauty was covered with a veil. See, we live in this body of clay. And this veil of flesh, if you allow it to, will hide any evidence that God is in your life. And the thing that's so dangerous about that, if you allow it to, then what you're doing, you're literally destroying or you're literally beginning to weaken and deteriorate, deteriorate those four divine virtues in your, in your children, um, trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving. So we do all this for the future generation. We live this life sacrificially so that our children can have better lives. And if you are a caring parent at all, which you are, then you want better for your children. You don't want worse for your children. You don't want them to go through the hell that you've gone through. I mean, unless you're twisted. And we can be very selfish, but you don't want that for them. But we've got this veil that we've got to make sure that the veil of flesh is not covering the glory of God on the inside. Let's go on. Even if our gospel message is veiled, it is only veiled to those who are perishing, for their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief. Their blindness keeps them from seeing the day spring light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the divine image of God. Now watch this. We, this is the, I think this is a problem that we all have. We don't preach ourselves. But most of the time we are. We don't preach ourselves, but rather the lordship of Jesus Christ, for we are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let brilliant light shine out of darkness, is the one who has cascaded his light into us. The brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ. We are like common clay jars. There we are. We're like common clay jars. that carry this glorious treasure within so that this immeasurable power will be seen as God's and not ours. Though we experience every kind, this is, remember, this is so good. Though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. At times, you don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. Say it out loud. Quitting is not an option. <laughs> Amen. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but not out. Amen. Hallelujah. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that that resurrection life of Jesus will be, re- will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death is at work in us, but it releases life in you. That's where the phrase come, comes from. If some, uh, for someone to live... Someone has to be willing to die. Someone has to be willing to surrender and humble themselves. That's why, listen, that's why much of the time in our Christian lives, we have to love by faith, forgive by faith, serve by faith, bless by faith, speak life by faith. Come on. It's all a journey of faith. Because if we let our humanness in, We'll live offended lives. We'll live shallow lives. We'll live uh, lives based on emotion instead of based on revelation. Verse 16. So no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. What is this? Nothing compared to the glories that shall come in eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. It's going to be glorious. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal weight, uh, an eternal weighty glory for beyond far beyond all comparison because we don't focus on our attention. We don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. (laughs) Isn't that good? Hallelujah. I'm going to go back to a phrase and close with this phrase. I can get my musicians up here. That'd be awesome. 
Yeah, my singers too. Singers and musicians, come forward, please. <laughs> this part of the service is brought to you by the singers. <laughs> um, I want to leave you with a phrase, to close with a phrase that was really impacted my life years ago. And that phrase is that this precious servant of Saul dropped Mephibosheth. When I read that, the Lord began to really minister to me on how that relates to us. How being dropped relates to us. See, when my parents decided to have children, they didn't one day decide, I think I'm going to drop our kids. I think I'm going to maim our children. I think, you know, our children are probably going to grow up and be cripples. No, they never thought that. But yet, I'm sure, because of some of the choices they made, we were dropped and we were crippled. My grandfather never woke up one day and decided, I think I'm going to drop some of my grandchildren. Never decided. I mean, it wasn't something he prepared for, but it did happen. Every one of us, I believe, in some measure were dropped, especially when we were little children. And it has affected our lives up to this point. We carry the scars. We carry the pain, the wounds of have, having been dropped. And so we're crippled. Maybe we're crippled in our personalities. Crippled, you know, in our attitudes. Crippled in how we see life because we look at life through the lens of our carnality and how we were raised rather than through the lens of God's word. And so we're crippled. But I'm so glad that, listen, isn't it interesting? Mephibosheth was never healed. He remained crippled until he entered eternity. And so we carry, it's just part of the journey. We carry sometimes the effects of a crippled upbringing. Yeah, you know, we just, we just carry it. No, it doesn't have to have us. I said it doesn't have to have us. Amen. We're masters. We're masters of our bodies. We're masters of our soul. Uh, again, don't misunderstand me. Jesus, of course, has to be master of everything, but we make the choice whether he is or not. So we live with our, we live with our brokenness. And if we, don't, if we don't realize, if we don't realize this, then over time we allow the, the, this crippling life to affect others around us. <laughs> I'm so glad, so grateful. I'm so grateful for God, for his love. Would you bow your head? I want to pray for you today. We're going we're gonna to pray together before we leave. One thing you have to know, and we just read this last week, and, uh, but I want to remind you, if you want to become a good-hearted person, you're going to have to let go and let God. You're going to have to let go of what has offended you, what has hurt you, you know, what has caused deep wounds in your life. You've got to let that go. How, Pastor? By faith. I don't told you that. God dealt with my heart years ago about that. I, I, I held unforgiveness in my heart towards a, a, a fellow believer. And God spoke to my heart as clear as I'm talking to you today. He says, you forgive him. Amen. That's how he said it. And man, I mean, I didn't argue with him. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Then I said, but how do I forgive him? He said, by faith. So I just, simply, there was no emotion involved. I didn't cry, didn't, there was no emotion. I just simply said, Lord, I forgive him by faith. I'm telling you, that thing was removed just like that. Now, I don't know whatever happened to that young man. I hope, I just, I hope everything good happened to him, you know. But I, I, I hope that, I have no idea. I haven't talked to him since. And that was way back in 1981. But I hope he had a good life. Hope he grew in his walk with God. Amen. But you got to, how many want a Christ-like life? You want a Christ-like life and everything about your life, you want a Christ-like. I do too. 
So you're going to have to let go and let God. Mark 11 says this, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, I love the Amplified, forgive him, let it drop, leave it, let it go. Forgive him, let it drop, leave it, let it go. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you of your own, your own, your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Romans 12, very, very short scripture, verse 21, do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <laughs> I love that. In Luke 6, 31, this is Jesus. He said, as you would like and desire that men would do to you, do exactly so to them. That is the golden rule. So if you desire a Christ-like life on a daily basis, then you gotta, deli- you gotta, you gotta develop a good heart, a humble, submissive, pliable, yielding heart to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Then you'll reap the favor of God in your life. Bow your head. I want to pray for you today. And I'm going to get on the piano and, and sing a song that I wrote. Um, I actually started writing the song in 2007. I had the date on that a long time ago. And I just uh, added a couple of verses to it. And um, you can sing it with me. Uh, but I want to pray for you today. As you bow your head, and I just want to, you know, I want to pray for you. Uh, I want to pray for you that if you allow God to do it, he'll heal your heart today. He'll he'll mend the wounds that have been been harassing you for years. Literally, he will heal them if you allow him to. And if you have anything against anyone, you let it go today by faith. Amen. I, I mean this. And all you have to do is say, Father... I let that thing go by faith in Jesus' name. I let that go by faith in Jesus' name. I forgive by faith in Jesus' name. I mean, whatever it is that you think is standing between you and the fullness of God's blessings in your life, you let it go. You let it go. I encourage you to. You don't have to. Cain didn't, but you're not Cain. You got a new heart. You got a pliable heart. You got a yielding heart because you have the heart of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So if that's you, say, Pastor, pray for me. I I, I want my heart healed so that everything else in my life can be healed. Lift your hand. I'll pray for you. Anybody like that today? Thank you. You can put your hand on. Why do you lift your hand? It isn't for me because I forget in a matter of seconds. Pastor Vicky knows that. I don't remember, uh, you know, faces. I just, you know, literally, I've had people sitting in front. I've had, I've had people sitting right in the front row. I said, were you in church this morning? Well, pastor, you looked at me a hundred times. Well, I do try to forget homely faces. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. So I want to pray for you today. And God's going to heal you. I said, God's going to heal you. Let's all lift our hands. And I'm going to pray for all of you. Heavenly Father, I pray for this precious congregation. And those, God, that have been wounded, those that have been hurt, those that have just uh, felt the pain, God, uh, of um, uh, the pain of, of being let down, the, the pain of being hurt, uh, the pain, God, of being uh, bruised, by, even in their childhood because they were dropped as a child. They were dropped spiritually. They were dropped emotionally. They were dropped, God, relationally. Whatever it is, Father, I ask you to bring healing to each and every one here today. Let's all lift our hands right now and just right now begin to thank him. Father, Amen. I just believe right now healing is flowing. Not only, God, not only emotional healing, spiritual healing, but God, physical healing, relational healing. Come on, everybody. Just uh, vocal, uh, speak out loud. Just say, thank you, God. Amen. It's so important that you let him know. And Father, I praise you, God, that right now you're healing each and every one, each and every heart, each and every soul, each and every body, each and every relationship. God, I thank you for that. And I give you praise now in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. And Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. And I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.